That sounds great. Awesome. Uh, so you all know Rebecca Minkoff because you're here, but she's an industry leader in accessible luxury, handbags, accessories, footwear, and apparel. Uh, I Tell me how you like this. So Rebecca Minkoff's playful and subtly edgy designs, I love that, uh, can be spotted around the world on young women and celebrities alike. Something that I really love is that it's accessible luxury. That, that's one of my favorites. Uh, and Rebecca is also the founder of the Female Founder Collective, which is a network of businesses led by women, supporting women. Uh, the mission is to enable and empower female-owned and led businesses to positively impact our communities, both socially and economically. Um, and Rebecca also has a book coming out soon. It's called Fearless, uh, The New Rules for Unlocking Creativity, Courage, and Success. Uh, Rebecca, when is it officially coming out and how do you feel? <laughs> it comes out June 15th. Um, I feel like I have a new full-time job that I didn't know I was signing up to have, but I'm incredibly excited about the book coming out and hopefully um, it impacts people and, and helps change their lives. That's the real goal. So if that happens, then I am happy. So you have, okay, so you have your, your fashion business, so that's full-time. You've got the Female Founder Collective, that's probably full-time. You've got the book coming out and you've got kids. So the... <laughs> And probably other things that I don't even know. So the question that I got asked, because uh, you saw there were some submitted questions and thank you all for, yeah. for doing that. Balance, you know, and we'll get into your the start of everything and, and moving into some of the themes in the book, but just beginning from, you know, today, like what does your day-to-day -day look like with all of those projects and how do you sort of stay sane? Okay, well, first of all, let's throw out the word balance. That was a term aimed at women to make us feel like failures. Men have never had balance either. If we even go back to caveman days when they had to go get killed to go get us food, that was not really balanced, right? So I think that we need to throw that, that idea that you can have it all, all at the same time out the window and you can have a lot of things and probably not all of them at the same time. So my day is incredibly scheduled down to the minute and I make lots of these. I have like, I know I'm a little crazy, but I have lots of lists on different sticky notes for all the different categories of my life, which help, keeps me organized. Um, but I would say that I have a team and that's an, an important part of this. I couldn't be with you guys if I didn't have a co-founder and a CEO running Female Founder Collective, where I have someone who edits all my podcasts, you know, someone who schedules them. So I'm able to you know, give my time to design, give my time to be a spokesperson, give my time to do podcasts, which is not every day, and then really commit and focus on this book. So um, does that answer the question? Yeah. I mean, does letting go, has that ever been a struggle for you? You know, when something's, you know, so close to you, I mean, you understand you have to delegate to grow, but that can sometimes be sort of difficult. So is that, is that natural for you to sort of let go of the way that you have in terms of galvanizing your team to take things off your plate? So I think a couple of things have made it easier. I used to be the person that would, after the kids would go to bed, no fail, check email, you know, check email all weekend. And I reached a point a couple of years ago where I said, I'm not curing cancer. I'm not disarming nuclear warheads. If I don't check my email on the weekend, actually, I think it'll be okay. And I tried it and it was okay. Yes. Uh, and so I said, in order for me to be refueled and revived and refreshed on a Monday, I got to stop that, that activity. Um, I think when it comes to the other things, I used to be the type of person pre-pandemic that was of the view that no one should work from home because who knows what they're doing and how could you delegate to people if you don't know what they're doing. And the pandemic has turned me into a completely different person with that respect. So I love delegating. If I can, I also took on five more jobs because there was no one to delegate to during the pandemic. So I think that, um, you know, if you have a team, it is important to delegate to them. Mm -hmm. um, and otherwise you won't grow. So you can't be that micromanager forever, but you have to identify like, what are you best at? Right. And how do you then say, okay, that's what I own and the rest, because not everyone's good at anything. You know, how do you start to give that off and, and make sure that you've done your due diligence so that when you're hiring these people, you can trust that you're delegating to the right person. Cause I think at the end of the day, that's what can be scary. Oh, well, I tried giving it to someone and they totally bombed at that. Then you don't want to do it again. But if you find the right person, it, it usually can work. Right, right. Did you, did you know you were going to become this person when you were growing up? Did you, did you want to be in design or what, what did you want to be when you were growing up? You know, 
I grew up in San Diego. And so I just thought I wanted to be like a boogie boarder, a pro boogie boarder. <laughs> but I fell in love with sewing when I was about eight years old. And um, I felt like all of a sudden I could have this idea. I could create it. I could make it. And that was really exciting. And so I became obsessed with it and did that, you know, all the way through high school and, and lots more time spent doing that than really anything else. Were your parents supportive? I mean, it's, it's a somewhat risky path, right? I mean, going into anything creative, I know that uh, parents can sometimes want you to do something more stable. So were your parents, how'd they feel about this? So my parents were like hippie children. Um, they were the anti uh, institution. So they said to me and my brothers, if you want to go do whatever it is you want to do, that's awesome. You don't want to go to college? Fine. You want to go to college? You're going to pay for it. So they were supportive in the sense that they weren't pushing me and it was kind of up to me, but that's where the support ended. There was no financial support with that. You can go, just go away. Right, right. Emotional support. And by the way, I was just in Coronado. I got back last night. So oh, beautiful. I know San Diego well. Um, so you said, you know, no financial support. How do you start a start a business, but also one that I assume is pretty capital heavy, right? And having inventory. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about the early days. And also, by the way, everybody watching here, I mean, jump in the chat. Taylor started it here with a great question. But if anyone else, you know, have you started a business? Are you interested in starting a business? Or, you know, you're just uh, listening, which is great too. Um, don't forget to use the chat. But, but yeah, for, for you, how did you begin um, both logistically, financially, and, you know, emotionally? <laughs> Well, it's a good thing that when you're young and you're a little bit naive, the emotional part is the easiest part. Um, I started my company when I was 21. It was through a fluke. I was making, I was working for a designer that was who was paying my my $4.75 paycheck every week. Um, and I was starting to make a lot of things on my own. And I was sending them to friends because they wanted it. That's This is when DIY was cool, pre-Etsy. <laughs> Um, and people like these cut up, ripped up shirts. And so I gave one to my sister-in-law. She wore it at a dinner with a well-known actress who wanted it. And I sent that actress, Jenna Elfman, a shirt on September 9th, 2001. She wore it on Jay Leno shortly thereafter. She said my name on national TV, which doesn't do much these days, but back then pre-social media, it did a lot. Um, and so overnight I became this person who would go down to Canal Street on my bike and negotiate with the I Love New York t-shirt people, uh, come back to my house, cut them up, bedazzle them and send them out. And that is all I did for nine months um, and did not make any money. Uh, everyone thinks like, oh, wow, so successful. Definitely not. Uh, <laughs> I, was able, I was able to eat and not pay my rent. That's how much money I was making. Um, and on the side, in order to sort of fund, you know, living in New York City, I was a stylist. I had met a director who gave me a chance and I proved to him I could do a good job. So that's how I was sort of able to keep up barely with life in New York City. And it wasn't until 2005 that Jenna came back to me and this is all in the book and it's a much uh, more detailed story, but she said, do you make bags? And I was like, yeah, I make bags, totally. Yes, when do you need one? And I had no idea what I was doing, um, but I found a local bag maker. I had two samples made. I shipped it to her for this film and it missed the shooting schedule. And her assistant called me and said, not making it into the film. It's two hours late. We already started filming. And I was like, well, can't you just swap out the bag? No, not happening. So that was devastating. It was my last 1600 bucks. Oh my God. One sample for her, one sample for me. Um, I'll fast forward a little bit to, to spare the run on sentence here, but a friend of mine um, wrote for a publication called Daily Candy, if anyone remembers yes. that. Yeah, I do. And it was called The Catwalk of Shame was the article if you want to Google it. And it and it lit up this fire that women loved the idea that this bag, you know, was something that they could take with them all night you know, out and see what happens the next day. And I think it was the era of sex in the city. So it just hit a nerve with women. And that's when I saw, okay, this thing is, this thing is huge. Um, and I called my dad. I was like, I'm not a loser anymore. Will you loan me some money? I promise I'll pay it back. And he was like, no, call your brother. So the early funding to answer your question was my brother mortgaged his house. We couldn't, we couldn't get a loan. He maxed out his credit cards 
Um, and when his wife would go to buy groceries, it would get declined and he would say, I have a lot of leather and you're going to get a really pretty bag, but oh. no groceries today. Oh my God. I'm so stressed out right now. You've like made me, I'm like about to break out into hives. How, I mean, this is a question for him really, but also for you, how do you feel comfortable with, I mean, are you comfortable with risk like that? I was comfortable. I guess it's, it's an interesting question. I'm now a homeowner and I'm now a credit card user. Yes. I probably would never mortgage my house. Okay. Uh, or max out my credit cards like he did. But he is a very savvy, smart businessman. And he could see the numbers going from, you know, 12 bags, 75 bags, 500 bags, 1,000 bags. And he could see that each time I was paying him back. So I think he felt a comfort level. And he he's much more risky on the financial front. But I didn't know. I was like, oh, thanks, bro. That's so generous of you. Mm -hmm. um, for that generosity, he got 50% of my company. So he did get something in return. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm looking at your, the, the way that your chapters are laid out here in the book, your first, well, first of all, they're rules. So rules number one through 21, um, sign your own permission slip. That's the first one. What does that mean? And why did you decide to start the book there? I wanted to start the book there because I think that as a little kid, you're told you need to ask permission for everything. And then you get to be an adult and there's still this sense that you have to ask permission. Do you think that I should start my own company? Do you think that I should ask for a raise? Do you think that I should ask for a promotion? Maybe you're just asking your friends, but why are they the ones that need to be the one to give you permission? If you want to do something, do it. And so I wanted to start off that chapter because I think in, in calling the book Fearless, I didn't mean that you just don't have fear. I mean that you have the fear, it's very real and you proceed anyways. And so first we gotta get rid of the idea that you need permission to do anything as a fully formed functioning adult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that something that you've struggled with or, or you sort of knew that from the beginning and you've always operated that way? I think it's been a little bit of both. I think, you know, when you're launching something new and you want people's opinions and you want the validation, there's, there's a little bit of a semblance there of asking for permission. Do you like this? Will you help me if you, if you think I'm worthy enough? And so I think that, you know, when anyone is starting anything, they're going to go through those emotions, but how could you sort of rely on your own confidence, your own steam and your own momentum as the basis for that versus other people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And something you mentioned, um, and I've heard this from other women and I'm certainly one of these is sort of saying yes before you're ready. Um, or, you know, in terms of like Jenna asking, you know, do you make bags? And you're like, I sure do, you know, um, but you have to sort of play catch up to, to your own uh, presentation. And that's sometimes where imposter syndrome can come in, right? You've presented yourself as this expert or competent or whatever, but then you're not sure, am I, am I? But I always say feeling a little bit like an imposter isn't bad because usually that means you've challenged yourself, right? You've kind of gone ahead over your skis, so to speak. Uh, but how do you, you know, and, and it could be from that book, uh, from the bag example or, or otherwise, how do you play catch up? Like, how do you quickly galvanize other people to help or, you know, just, I mean, it, it, whether it's a concrete example or, or otherwise, how do you make things happen when you've presented as if you already have done it? I think it takes the ability to have the skill of knowing how to organize and knowing what is strategic and what isn't. Okay. And the only way I think you can learn that skill is by practice. Um, you know, we had an opportunity. We would we do surveys on our customers frequently. And the last two times we've done the survey, it's been the number one categories people want us to launch next are home and loungewear, which surprised me. And we all of a sudden had an opportunity presented, hey, we would like to be the people that launch your home and loungewear. And it was like, we didn't have a team, we weren't ready, but it was like, okay, what is the most important thing we have to do? You know, again, I show, I laughingly showed you these, but these, you know, helped me sort of strategically write out what is imperative to get this done, what type of person, what type of team, um, and then make sure you're really good at delegating because a lot of these things, again, won't happen unless you know exactly what you need and then you have someone to delegate that to. And if you're just a one woman show, you're gonna be delegating to yourself. So I used to run uptown, 
go buy the leather, then go to Home Depot, go buy the hardware, then get the lining from somewhere else and then deliver it all to my guy. And be like, okay, when can you get this to me by? Is there any, should I stay here? Sometimes I would sit at the factory all day just because I felt like my presence there would make them work faster. Then I would ship it out. Then I would collect the credit card. So it is possible. It's a lot of work, but um, there were no nights and weekends then. Let me, let me say that. Yeah. Did, uh, what did your apartment look like? Did you have a bunch of merchandise in your apartment? Were you like bedazzling things? Like what, tell us like those early days, like, were you stepping over fabrics? <laughs> oh my gosh. So when I had the bags, um, I was in a fifth floor walk-up and I would ship the bags out of there. So convincing a UPS fan to come and, uh, go down the stairs with all the boxes. I think my first big order was anthropology. They ordered like 200 bags. So I was stuffing them and then I was helping him carry everything downstairs. Um, and I think that it was just, it was just my office, you know? So it was slightly an apartment, but mostly my office. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, how much uh, in those early days were, well, actually, let me move on from that for, for a second. You mentioned getting feedback right? Seeing, you know, that people were requesting loungewear, home goods and things like that. How much of what you do is your idea and sort of um, impacting kind of culture versus people telling you what they want and kind of approaching this from data? It has to be both. I think if you are a creator, people are leaning on you for your ideas and what you bring to it, but you have to listen to people. You have to, you have to basically make sure that you are understanding, like we did a survey. Okay, we're gonna bring you home and loungewear or what is important to you? Is sustainability important to you? And how do I listen to you? Or are certain fabrics important to you? So there's all kinds of touch points where you can listen to your consumer, but then it's your responsibility to give them what they didn't know they needed in that package as the creator. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I know one of your chapters is called point of view is everything. And, and people talk about writing mission statements, particularly at the beginning of, of businesses. Were you concrete about your point of view from the beginning or has that evolved over time? It is widened in scope. I think I knew when I, I didn't necessarily have a, the strongest point of view when I just had the apparel. Okay. I, I knew it was very clear what it was but um, it was limited. I think once I hit on the morning after bag and I knew that women connect their bags to these milestone moments within their journey, whether it's a raise or a new job or a divorce or a marriage, whatever, ha whatever that event is, she connects her bag. So the morning after bag hit on that New York City, sex in the city, lifestyle milestone moment. And so then it was truly about building a brand that sort of supported that idea that's changed a lot. You know, we thought we had to do fantastical runway shows with clothing you'd never wear that had nothing to do with our girl and it didn't work, frankly. So I think as we've gotten smarter and more honest with ourselves, that's when we can say, okay, what is she wearing? She's wearing a cute top, you know, like a casual cute top. That's what she wants to go out on a, you know, for Sunday brunch or whatever it is. And so I think we've widened the view to be more appropriate to what that means to our customer, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so thinking about the runway stuff and it can be painful, uh, but very smart and strategic to acknowledge when something isn't working, whether you wanna give that as an example and, or any other, how, how do you feel and how do you move quickly when you say, you know what, I think, I think we have to change what we're doing? It is not easy and sometimes it really sucks. And it sucks if someone else discovers it and tells it to you before you have... <laughs> Had that happen yourself. So whether it was, you know, okay, we're trying to be like everybody else. We're trying to have these fantastical runway shows um, and no one cares. It didn't make me more of a fashion darling with the editorial community. It didn't make Barney's come by us mm -hmm. uh, and our customer wasn't buying it and I couldn't wear it. I was like, where am I going in these things? So <laughs> I think it was that tough nut to swallow where you're like, we've lost millions of dollars doing this, but we need to make clothing that anyone can wear every day. They don't feel like it's wearing them. So that was hard and costly millions and millions of dollars in waste. Um, or, or if you just, you know, small example, but more recent example, if you look at our Instagram grid, uh, you know, we did pandemic Instagram social media for a year. And then we felt like the sentiment changed. It didn't have to be as much of a DIY Rebecca doing everything, Rebecca, taking all the video and all that. And so, you know, we had to make that switch and it had to happen very, 
definitively. That's not a tough nut to swallow either when you're like, all right, things have changed and we have to do things differently now. So I think it's always good to take those temperatures and to ensure that you are pivoting when you need to, because things move fast, especially right now. Yeah. I think there's something sort of liberating when your hand is forced. You're like, this is, this is the right decision, you know, and it's scary. Uh, you're not sure where it's going to go, but it's just so clear. If something's not working, at least, you know, the path forward because you don't, you're not going to be on the path that you just were. Um, there's a, uh, I mean, one of your chapters says, love it and leave it. Be okay with walking away. Is that the example that you would give? Or are there other, you know, in terms of the runway, are there other examples that you, you know, have in the book about times where you said, I I've got to make a different, you know, a different choice here? Yeah, there's one example and I'm not, I don't think it's in the book, but the clothing one is definitely there. But we were asked by Saks Fifth Avenue many years ago to do a higher end line. They came to us, they said, we want you to do bags between 1,000 and 5,000. We think this could be great. We spent so much money designing these beautiful bags with, uh, you know, exotic skins, uh, you, you name it, the bells and whistles were there. And let's just be honest, if you're a woman with $3,000, you're probably gonna buy Chanel. No offense to me, but that's where you're gonna put your money because that Chanel lock for three grand means a lot more than Rebecca Minkoff when Rebecca Minkoff has bags that are $195. So we did that for, I believe a year and it just didn't work. And I could have pointed the finger at Saks and said, you told me to do this. You know, it didn't work, but we had to just eat it up and say, okay, we tried it. And we have to move on because it's taking our concentration and our focus away from what is working. Mm, mm -hmm. um, I love that you said, no offense to me, Chanel. And I saw somebody smile, Nayeli Valentine. She, she, yeah, there she go. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you have to know who you are and that's great because people, that makes me feel comfortable being able to afford this beautiful bag because I can't do Chanel. And sometimes, you know, I feel recognized when I see what you, uh, what you create. Do you wear every single item? Like, is that ever a litmus test for you? You know, let me sort of create something, a little like trial run, see how I feel. Like, I mean, you are your best advocate. Yeah, so I, it would be impossible humanly to wear everything, but I wear a lot. Um, I have so many boxes, my husband, if we ever do get divorced, that will be the reason. There are too many boxes at our house. Um, so I, he feels like I'm a UPS facility, but I'm always trying the bags, making sure what's good, what's bad. Same with, with all the product really, as much as I can, because I think that I want to know that my end consumer, if she experienced something she didn't like that, that I've already thought through that and what that could be. Mm -hmm. I can't believe there's still the UPS theme happening in your life from the beginning till now. Um, uh, I'm going to get into the pandemic in a bit, everybody, because I know we've got a lot of questions about that, but we'll hold off on it uh, for a minute. I, I actually want to focus a little bit on networking, community building. Um, I mean, I first of all, just between you and me, well, I guess, and everybody here, you are so nice to me and delays get paid and we're continually shocked. Uh, and, although we need to get over ourselves and just recognize we all bring a lot of value. But I remember first meeting you and, and Ashley, you know, we were there and we said, wow, she's like talking to us, right? You know, it's intimidating, right? When you meet somebody who's so successful, uh, but that is also the key to building relationships is to be kind to everybody, to always be thinking about paying it forward. Uh, now in the book, you know, you have create two way streets, right? That's the title of this chapter. Uh, networking flows both ways. So how does, what does that look like to you? Uh, so that was my perspective of feeling so, you know, honored, but now I see it's create two-way streets. So maybe let's dig a little bit in, into that. And if we have any tangibles for folks, uh, especially now in this kind of digital networking world, I, I'd love to, to hear that. For sure. So I think you can all remember an encounter with someone where you left feeling like shit because of how uh, fabulous they thought they were, diva-like, didn't have time for you, wouldn't give you the time of day. So that in a microcosm is unfortunately was a lot of the fashion industry. And so having come into fashion from the outside, Anna Winter did not bless me as her uh, up and coming fashion designer and having to like weasel my way in, I never wanted to create that feeling in another that I was so often the recipient of. So that, you know, and no one feels good after those situations. So when it comes to networking, I think that a lot of people confuse that with social climbing. 
I think as you, as if you are always offering something to someone, it might not be that Mary and you can swap whatever it is, but if Mary helps you, you can help Jane. And I think that taking that mentality of, well, I'm just starting out. Who could I possibly help? You can help a lot of people who aren't in the position you're in. And I think when you create that cycle, whether it's karma or whatever you want to call it, a lot more people will be more willing to help you. And I think it's really important that when you get to a position, I'm sorry for all the noise, you guys. <laughs> my dad is making lunch. Um, I thought it was me because my coffee, I think, just ended. So no, my dad's in the kitchen and I'm living in his house right now. So, <laughs> um, so I think it's important that you are able to figure out a, your values and what you can bring to someone else. But also when you get that opportunity to network, identifying very clearly what that person can help you with. Because I think you probably get this and maybe some of you have heard this like, hey, do you have 15 minutes to have coffee with me? You know, could, we, could you tell me your story? How did you get started? None of those things will help you. What will help you is if you're really specific. You know, I'm, Stan, uh, I'm Sandra Spato. I have this, I'm able to give this. And so I think with this digital networking, the best thing you could do is in your, in your Zooms, who you are, if it lets you and what you can give and what you need. And mm. then people can start putting together and connecting. Okay, good, I can help you and she can help me. And it just becomes a growing circle of, of women supporting each other. Mm, mm -hmm. Has there been anybody in your life um, and I don't, I, I don't love the word mentor. I feel like that a lot of pressure gets put on that word, but anybody who's kind of cleared the path for you or been there at different points in your life to kind of lend a hand or sort of provide wisdom. I agree with you. I actually hate the word mentor. When, when I was starting out there, what, that wasn't a word. And then suddenly it became like, well, you need a mentor. Or you'll never be successful. No, you need a sponsor or you need someone who can give you again a very uh clear line of help so the women that have helped me have been the ones that have given me a lot of tough love uh starting with my mom and then the first ceo that i worked for when i worked for this designer to the head of the showroom and it wasn't them handing me anything it was you need to do this go figure it out now the next step is this go figure it out and so it was a lot of that type of directing me to an area that i had to figure out versus you know, here is the platter on which I'm going to hand you success. Um, and so I, I do want to say though, with mentorship, mentorship is all around you. It's not, it's not that you need to be mentored by the CEO of the fortune 500 company. You can get mentorship with someone on your team from someone below you. Um, it's all around you. And it's, it's anyone who knows what you don't. And let me tell you, when I was an intern at this fashion company and I worked in this shipping department, that was incredibly valuable because now I know how to ship stuff. It sounds simple. Clearly, clearly the UPS theme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but it's those little things that when you, you know, that shipping guy mentored me in a way, you know, he taught me how to do something that was a valuable skill later on. That's so interesting. And by the way, I always say, you know, the people in my life who mentored me, they have no idea that they've been my mentor, you know? And, and I frequently say that. I mean, one of the biggest influences in my life and somebody who really got me to expand my definition of success is this older guy in real estate. Like I, that seems to have nothing to do with what I do, but he urged me to think bigger than maybe kind of the traditional lens of what success is. Actually, speaking of success, how, how do you define success for yourself, whether it's personal or professional? I would say that success is defined differently at different phases of your life and different uh, things that you go through. So success used to mean to me that I could not call the chase number on the back of my car to see if I could afford to go out to dinner. I was like, finally, I can go out to dinner and I know there's $100 in my account so I can eat tonight. Um, then success became, I can have a baby and I can leave the office at 6.30 every night to go home. Then success was, I'm not checking email on the weekends. Now success is the fact that I can have the Female Founder Collective. I can have a podcast. I can come out with a book and the company can keep going. Um, and that I don't have to be worrying about the shipping back to the UPS yeah. theme um, or, or some of the other things that, that I used to do all by myself. So it changes and your definition of what that means, but you can't let success mean I'm rich. That, that money might not ever come, 
But if you love what you do, and this is not easy, I'm saying this to you, it's not easy. If you love what you do so much, that's the reward. Um, because, you know, I've, I've interviewed and met enough people that I was like, wow, they're so successful. And then, you know, it's not about that money at the end of the day. And some of them never got the money, but they achieved great success. Mm -hmm. And that it's personal, that you really have to spend time self-reflecting and that it's not, again, this thing that you set at the beginning of your career. And that is the way it will be. It does have to change based on sort of where you are in, in your life and what you're what your priorities are. I mean, I see in rule two, you said go for purpose over payout. Happiness is not a time card. Uh, what does that mean? That's where I talk about your passion and that if you love what you do so much, then it isn't about clocking in and clocking out. You know, I think that uh, you could say, okay, well, I have to make money and I had to get a job totally fair things. You might hate those things, right? How could you find something that you love to do or some native talent you have and bring that to your job? Maybe you love talking and maybe you love, um, I don't know, helping people. Do you transition to a customer service facing position versus one where you're crunching numbers? Um, and so I think you just have to really figure out what is your passion? Can your current job help fuel that? help support it. If it can't, how can you be making moves in the background to do that? And if that, you know, if that doesn't happen right away, what outside of your life could fuel that so that, you know, you need the paycheck, you have to pay your rent, you have children you're taking care of. Um, but that outside of that work environment, you can continue to feel that passion while you're figuring out, okay, this isn't helping me. I got to get out of this, but I have to, it's going to take some time to do that, uh, smartly. Um, but it's hard to sustain passion. I mean, those were a lot of questions that got submitted, um, especially now feeling yeah. really drained. Uh, how do you, yeah, how do you keep going when the original passion isn't there? So I think to expect that the passion will be there all the time is going to set yourself up for failure. Okay. I've had so more moments than I can count where I've been like, I don't have any passion for this right now. And I talk about that in the book. Um, when, when I felt the most burnt out was when I was coming back from a maternity leave. So I should have been theoretically well, well rested, even though we know that's a lie. Um, <laughs> but I was like, I don't recognize this company. And I, I left for a month or two and now everyone's changed and the processes are changing and the creative is changing. And I did, that's when I felt less passionate because something that I had done, I didn't recognize anymore. And so I think when you when you start to feel not as passionate, you have to go back to the why. Why did you start this? What got you interested in it in the first place? What's happened that's changed and how can you take control of that back and make the steps to get it back to where it's a place that you love it? And that doesn't mean overnight. Mm -hmm. We went through something uh, two years ago where I was beyond passionless mm -hmm. and it took a year to get it back on track. And it took a higher that I hated everything about him, except for the fact that he was like, the missing ingredient in the brand right now, you guys, is your, is look at, she's in this room, she's right here, you know? And so as much as I thought he was a liar about everything else he brought to our company, he recognized, hey, we gotta bring this asset back in and let her be a voice and a part of this again. And so I think that you can do that for yourself in your job. You can find out where, where was that passion? What was the why? And then take the steps and it might take, a long time. So just know that. Do you feel pressure as a public figure, you know, and just speaking, you know, something, a conversation we have at, at Ladies Get Paid is how much, um, what's the intersection between me, what I do, writing the book, all of my speaking, and then Ladies Get Paid as it stands on its own. Like where do, you know, we want them to be separate entities. I, uh, you know, part of it is so that I can grow as, as a person myself and that the business can be okay on its own, you know, but of course they intersect uh, and, and they should. So for you, I mean, you're on the Instagram, you're here, you wrote the book, you have your company, you also have Female Founder Collective. Is that a conversation that you have with yourself, with your team, you know, where you intersect with all of your initiatives? It's very complicated as yeah. you have imagined because my name is my brand and it's also who I am. And right. I think there are lots of conversations internally. Where do I intersect? So you know, from March of last year up until probably March of this year for a whole year, it was a lot of me. Mm 
Right. That was because of the state we were in as a company, our ability to produce content, and what we felt was really the the best way as as me and as a brand, we were just being real. Yeah. And then as things have opened up, we also have to remember we are a brand. A woman comes to us for an access, accessible luxury product. So it can't just be me in my backyard anymore. Does that make you want to spend $300 if I'm dancing in my backyard? Maybe not. You might think I'm entertaining and fun. So it was really about right-sizing the balance and making sure that where you see us show up as a brand and our brand promise to you is there. And then where I need to be, whether that's on different platforms or showing up in other places, then that's more of a place that I can play in too. So if I show up as a founder on LinkedIn or doing these talks or interviewing women on my podcast, that's where the founderness comes in. And the um, and then on Instagram, it's really about positioning it as a brand. And I'm in there, but it's not the me show. So it's it's it can be confusing. And uh, if you name your company not yourself, it's a lot easier to disconnect from it. So it definitely goes like this a lot. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's interesting for me to hear just from a personal standpoint. But you're right, I didn't name the company after myself. But I am clear it gets paid on Instagram, right? So, and that's continual dialogue. I live around the corner, by the way, from uh, your store. Uh, and I'm in West Hollywood, but closer to, really close to Beverly Hills. And, and then your brother has a store next to you. I know they're closed for the moment. And 70%, I think, of your business got stalled. Uh, with clo- you know closing of, of stores and, and not just your own, but I know you're distributed by hundreds of, of stores. Maybe let's talk about the pandemic a little bit. Early days, okay, early days. And then how you as a leader maybe has evolved and also where you're feeling positive because I, I know that you have seen opportunity, you know, both for yourself, but also for other women who are starting small businesses. Yeah. So March 22nd, 2020, um, 70% of our business basically evaporated overnight. Um, our business was predominantly wholesale, meaning we sell to the Neiman Marcus, Saks, Bloomingdale's of the world. And 30% of our business was direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. Our daily dialogue prior to that was how did Nordstrom's do today? What did they do? What did they think of the line? It was always about them. And what we did on our site was great, but it was like, okay, whatever. We're not paying attention to that when you're faced with all of that business going away with no foreseeable return, you get good at looking in your backyard real quick. So it was the hardest month of my life. We had to let go of um, almost 50% of the team and furlough a couple more. I was crying nonstop, oh crying and drinking. That was like my, um, that was that was awful because we were, we were letting go of people that had been with me for seven, 12 years. Oh, right? wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was awful. There was yeah. no sugar coating it. It was horrific. Um, but with that much business falling off of a cliff, we couldn't, you know, I was fighting to keep everyone and my brother, who's my business partner and, found, and co-founder was like, if we hold on to everyone, we'll just go out of business. So the whole ship can sink or we can save part of it. Right. Um, and that was, that's a hard lesson that as an entrepreneur, you have to sometimes get that silver, you know, that, that metal stomach to, to deal with that. Um, once that part was over, it became about really going back to my roots as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. How are we going to get eyeballs? How are we going to get traffic? Okay. You know, it almost became day trading. If you guys all know what that term is. Um, where every day you're living and dying theoretically on the business that you do that day. So to have 25 people focused on our site made us incredibly smart. It made us um, fantastic e-commerce people. We got very close with our customer. We got very real on social. We got very real on email. Um, So what happened was a silver lining. It was uh, emerging from that, you know, up 10% over the year before, and, and coming out of there with strength and knowledge and, and also never again will we let ourselves get into relationships business-wise that could potentially harm us like they did. So we're still gonna continue to sell wholesale, but it's really like, if you want the stuff, that's awesome. We love working with you, but we're not gonna be doing all the wheeling and dealing that it used to take to be in these stores. So that's another discussion. Yeah, I was uh, gonna say, how is the fashion industry? I mean, that is a whole other discussion, but. How have you seen the fashion industry change from when you started and where do you think it's going or where do you hope that it it should go? When I started like in 2005 or yeah, 
So the, the industry was very insular, very closed, very clicky. Obviously, social media has democratized that. I think we have a lot of work to do when it comes to racial inequity. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of work to be done in size inclusivity, which it's easy to tell a brand, make bigger sizes. It is actually logistically a lot of work and also very costly. So uh, same with sustainability. It's easy to say, just be sustainable. Um, it's really hard. I've been working on it for two years to get plastic out of my supply chain and I'm still not there yet. So I think that we have to make seismic shifts in those three areas uh, to really, as an industry, not survive because people will always need clothing, but to make true impact that maybe the customer never notices, but the, the planet does. Or a little girl who never sees herself represented gets to see someone that looks like her. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate you saying that it's really hard too, because we have an expectation that things should move way quicker than is literally physically possible, especially when you have so many moving parts, as I imagine, with factories and, and things like that. Uh, Female Founder Collective, let, let's talk a little bit about that. Did you, I mean, assuming you've always been passionate about supporting women, when did you say, let's actually make something here? you know, where we need an ecosystem, we need to formalize it. Like, at what point did you think that that was a good move? Again, adding more things to your already very full plate. Well, I had a fortuitous, I guess, a very productive maternity leave because when I came back to the office, sorry, let me step back for a minute. When I was about to go on maternity leave, we hired a woman who was going to run the creative team. So I went from having 18 direct reports to just one. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was like, I want a real maternity leave. I'm <laughs> sick of this bullshit where I'm, I'm working the whole time. So I'm going to peace out. I've never done this before. I'll be back in three months. I lasted six weeks. But <laughs> what it did is it, it, it freed up a lot of time for me where I'm still meeting with my team. I'm still designing. But I'm not in the day-to-day, -day, like the Pantone of this is going to be number three and all the nitty gritty that takes up a lot of time. So as I was sort of amping up and getting out and on the speaker circuit, I don't know if you felt this way, Claire, but all I was hearing was wage inequality, the gap, 80 cents on the dollar, women of color, less, 50 cents. And this was an echo chamber and the numbers weren't changing. You didn't see statistics come out saying, actually, we got it up by a cent or more women were hired. And I was thinking, what could I do? I think community is important, as you know, as what you've built with Ladies Get Paid. Education is extraordinarily important, especially because women and men start their businesses a lot of the times with a passion, but not an education to back that up. Mm -hmm. And then three, could there be a recognizable seal that any consumer could support women? Just in the fact that I turn over my beauty products, if they're vegan or non-GMO to buy my food, could I say, oh, woman, great doing that. So that was the goal. Um, I had no idea the excitement and the sort of galvanizing that would occur because of it. So that was in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, again, brought on my co-founder, Ali Wyatt, who has incredible experience in this arena. So we've really built out an education platform that exists offline, not right now, online right now. Um, we have a membership community and we have a seal that's on over 3 million products that would hopefully reach you know, mainstream soon that people can go, oh, woman, yes, I'm going to buy that instead of Tide. Or I'm going to, I'm going to eat at this little coffee stop shop instead of Starbucks. Like all those choices as a consumer make huge differences. So if you're a female entrepreneur and you want a community of founders, uh, you can find us at the Female Founder Collective. And tell us what's the website? Femalefoundercollective.com. And it is really sparse right now because we are about to relaunch in about two weeks. So it's beautiful and I'm so excited and there's going to be a paid component as well where we're going to be able to give you access to a lot more exciting programming and opportunities, but yes. So if you're like, that's all it is, it's changing in about two weeks. Okay. Good. Uh, so everybody sign up for the, the newsletter alerts. So you get that. Um, but let's talk about that seal actually for, for a second. Cause I, I've seen it around. I mean, I've seen it here in LA. I've seen it in New York. Something that I do love about it, and you alluded to this, is it reminds people that businesses are people, right? Like this is personal. How did you get the first few businesses to adopt the, I mean, now it's a lot, right? How did you get the first few businesses to adopt putting that seal on, uh, whether it was on their website or, you know, uh, on their storefront if they had it? And then how did you grow? How did you make, you know, get the word out and get other businesses to adopt it? 
I was basically of the mindset, I need to approach as many people who have lots of packaging as possible and key sort of influencers who have stores. So I sent personal emails to anyone I could think of that was a female founder that produced lots of packaging. So Birchbox, 2 million packages a year, um, done. Lola tampons, done. My All my stuff, done. And so I just kept sort of attacking all the different women-owned businesses that are producing that kind of thing. And then I went out to women I knew who had store locations. Will you put this in the front of your store? He's a, here's a decal we can send you. So it was very grassroots, um, but it wasn't hard to talk people into it. Once they see and get the idea, they're like, oh yeah, duh, why, why wouldn't I want this? Right. Have you worked with Yelp? Or is that, are those conversations that you've had with them? I mean, now I see, um, they say women led or LGBTQ led, which I think is yeah. relatively new and maybe influenced yeah. by you, but yeah, what, what have those conversations look like? So I approached them, I guess it was two years ago. And I said, you should have a woman owned, we should be able to sort our restaurants or yeah. businesses by women owned. And they were like, that's really expensive to do. <laughs> but what if we allow people to opt in to being that? And I said, great. So we launched this campaign. It was beautiful. Um, 75,000 people clicked that I am woman owned. And because of that, this last International Women's Day, we came back and they did launch uh, the ability to sort by that, which is really exciting. So I will take the credit for that. Yeah, um, good. As uh, you yeah, so, but they've been incredible partners and, and hopefully it's those little things that start changing people's habits. I mean, that's how we sort and that's where we go. Uh, especially every weekend we find a new coffee shop and there's a ton that are, are women led, which we would have never known before. Yeah. I love, we got a comment here. Being here today has given me a greater respect for Rebecca and her brand. I'll never forget the saying that people do business with people. And I see why Rebecca's brand has longevity. Very impressed. Yay. We love that. Um, by the way, we have about eight minutes left. So use this opportunity yeah, to jump in the chat. The book, let's talk about the book. Oh, a no, I just wanted to... I just wanted to say where people can buy it. Yes. Okay. Uh, if you go to readfearless.com or anywhere you want to buy a book, I really don't care, but readfearless.com if you want an easy site. Um, not only do you get the book, when you buy the book and pre-order it, you get the first half of the book digitally. You get a $25 gift card from me for Rebecca Minkoff, and you get an invitation to my June 15th launch and my masterclass, which I just filmed, which you'll get in a few weeks. So I'm basically paying you to read this book because I want you to change your life. So uh, don't hesitate if you thought any of this was valuable to grab the book because there's more inside of it. Cindy wants you to repeat the URL. So is it read, what is it? Read? Readfearless.com. Readfearless.com. Um, why, why the decision to release half digitally? Because now I'm like, should I do that with my book? Like what, what was the rationale behind that? It was honestly my publisher. They said, this is a good way to get people excited. And they feel like they, they're getting something immediately because it's not a normal habit for yeah. people to wait three months. You know, I've been talking about people buying this book since February. Who mm -hmm. buys a book in February if it comes out in June? So this was one of their suggestions. Interesting. What was the process like for you? I mean, now this is uh, very personal. So what was the process of writing like uh, for you? And also, did you know that you wanted to write a book? And, and you, you know, you proactively went to publishers or did this opportunity come to you? Both. I knew I wanted to write a book. I wasn't sure on what. I knew that the last thing I would do in Over My Dead Body would be a book about like the history of handbags, your coffee table book by Rebecca Minkoff. Like that just uh -huh. made me like, ugh. Um, so I was in a car with another author. I had just been on her podcast. Her name's Nicole Lappin. Uh -huh. She has some shit incredible works like becoming super women and I think boss bitch um and she was like you should write a book and I was like that's the thing Nicole I don't know about what she's like you have a lot of experience you could actually help a lot of people and I was like I never thought about that but that sounds great I could do that and I could tell my story uh as I weave in sort of the the lessons I want you to take from it so she introduced me to her agent and uh, we pitched it and it was liked. And that was kind of how it happened, which I realize is not how it goes for everybody. But that's that's the how it went for me. But it goes back to the theme of there's an opportunity, right? There's somebody who believes in you uh, and you just say yes and you figure it out as you do it. I definitely figured it out as I did it. And I had, 
you know, I didn't know how to write an outline. I didn't know how to like shape a chapter. Like I had, I had to work with someone to help me really do all that. And, you know, I didn't go in there saying, I know exactly how to do this. So also take the opportunities, you know, build it as you go and then get a lot of feedback from people who've done this before. How easy it is, is it for you to receive feedback? Because that, A, that's a personal question for me, but also I, I hear that a lot uh, from women in the community who are hard on themselves to begin with, right? Maybe they're perfectionists. And then somebody gives them critical feedback and it seems to just confirm a lot of fears they may have had about themselves and, and maybe their abilities. So how, how do you receive feedback? Oh man, it really, I think, depends on the tone of the person issuing it. Yeah. So I'll be real vulnerable here. Um, if my brother gives me feedback, it drives me crazy because he says it in a way that he's able to hit buttons that have existed for the last 40 years. But the president of my company will give me the same exact feedback and I'll be like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. Yep, totally on board, great. So I think it's the tone of how it's delivered. It's the intention of how it's delivered. You know, when someone's giving you feedback, they're, you can tell usually, oh, they're just trying to make me feel bad versus I actually want to help you. Right. And so I think that it sucks. It, no matter who it is, it's going to suck if the intention is, I want to make you feel like a piece of shit. Mm, mm -hmm. The process of editing. I mean, I, I found it in, in what I did. It's actually not so much about the writing as it is about the editing. And that's where the magic comes in. What was that process like for you? The writing, the editing, the rewriting? Are you even happy with, you know, again, perfectionism, like, are you happy with the end product? Would you do things differently? Do you want to write another book? Like it's, it's an intense project, um, physically, emotionally, logistically, all that. So how do you feel now that it's about to come out and it's in a way not really going to be yours anymore. It's going to be us who read it and live it. Gary, um, if I had to redo it all over again, I think that I would have just written a stream of consciousness, unedited, just no chapters, no outline, whatever. And I would have had an editor come in and shape it. Mm -hmm. I think what made it difficult for me was each chapter had to be succinct and about something mm -hmm. and about my story and then the rule. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for me to feel those guide rails, mm -hmm. hard rails. Um, there was a lot of editing and there was a lot of like deep questions that I was like, I don't know what was the color of my shirt in 1992 when I got the call. I don't know what that yeah. was, yeah. you know? Luckily my husband remembered some of my outfits, but like she really wanted these details that make a book so much better that I was like, I don't have time to tell you what the smell of a flower is. Like, ah, my kid wants to eat their dinner, you know? Right. So that was hard for me. I don't know if you felt that way. Yeah. Well, fortunately I wasn't really telling my own stories. I was telling other women's stories and then pushing them to say, let's get back into the mindset of where you were and details that you remember. And it almost felt like deep therapy work, like closing their eyes, visualizing, you know, what is the first thing that comes to mind? I mean, at this point I like should probably get a therapy degree, um, you know, and then the joke is buy the book, but also get a therapist because it really forces you to go very, very deep inside uh, to where you were. And, and I so appreciate you being vulnerable, you know, here today. And, and I'm sure in the book, if there's anything you want to leave folks with in the last minute, whether it's life lessons or just by the book, I mean, we always, we want to leave everybody with that. This is, this is your time. One second, I'm going to have, sorry, so much going on here. If you want to know even more, why am I at my dad's house? Well, we're living with him until the school year is over because mommy was not a good teacher. So my kids had to go to school in Florida and that's where I am right now. But I digress. Um, I think when you hear the title of the book, Fearless, so many women just are like, well, I'm scared. So that's not me. And I think my goal with anything you do, you're going to be scared. You're going to have fear. Fear is an emotion that was hardwired into us for a reason, but you can't let it stop you. Um, you have to persist through it and you have to get good at pushing it aside. And when you do that enough, it will become easier. So if there's a new step you want to take or a new path or a new career or a job or a, a person or a partner, whatever it is, recognize the fear and just push through it because you are the only one stopping yourself and, and no one's going to sit there and be like, I see you, you're stopping yourself. I'm going to, I'm going to get you out of this one. 
Uh, so just really make sure that you recognize that and you don't let it control your life. And that's mm -hmm. the goal of the book. And I think uh, we all need to remind ourselves that we've proven before, and maybe it was in high school, maybe you went to a new school or you've proven times before where you push through the fear. And so even though, well, hopefully it's, you're doing bigger and better things and the stakes are being raised, you know, don't forget how far you've, you've come. So thanks for being here. I always oh like you. Thanks for doing this with me. Thank yeah. you so much. And, and I'm nice just gonna, you all. Yes. You yes. For and for, for the hundreds of folks who will watch this later, thank you as well. So readfearless.com. It's available for pre-order. Rebecca's basically paying you to get the book. So you're, you know, a lot more, uh, I mean, I'm not paying you to get my book, but you know, there you go. Ladiesgetpaid.com slash book. And of course, ladiesgetpaid.com slash join to join our Slack group. Let me just drop the Female Founder Collective uh, URL in there as well, because this, this is a great resource. There you go. And follow, follow you on Instagram. What is at Rebecca Minkoff? It's at Rebecca Minkoff. Yep. And I'm, I'm in my DM so you can slide into them. Awesome. Me too. Claire gets paid. Thank you all. Happy almost Friday. Thank God. Um, and uh, say hi to your parents for me. Okay. <laughs> the back. All right. Good to